To begin the message this morning, we will start with a short video. In a matter of days, the exciting moments in the games of the 31st Olympiad in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil will begin. A tradition dating to ancient Greece in the 8th century BC. Athletic metaphors in the New Testament illustrating principles that would have been familiar to readers of the time. The biblical passage with the most references to competitive games is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. The Apostle Paul compares the Olympic-style races to life and says in part, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes goes into strict training, so that I myself will not be disqualified of the prize. Engage with the Bible in its stories of victory and defeat. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Amen. So you know what we're going to talk about today? God's Olympics. Are you in God's Olympics? Are you God's athletes uh, this morning? We have heard in this video that in the time the New Testament has been written, that the writer of the New Testament were certainly aware of the Olympics. They, they, they knew it. It was evident that Paul, especially, was familiar with Olympic Games. There's so many scriptures in the New Testament talking about wrestling, fighting. They use the word agony, actually, when it talks about com competing. Like the agony is really something that is, requires striving. It's, it's hard. It's a competition. It's, it's a fight. It's boxing, it's wrestling, and, and this. so this morning we want to talk about that. And the text that we have uh, uh, mentioned in the videos, do you not know that in a race all runners run? So I hope you are all running this morning. Hello? Are you running? Yes. yes, but only one gets the prize. Actually, if you all run this morning, you will all get a prize. But run in such a way, that's this, this metaphor is used here to, to make a point. Run to win. Just don't run or walk or crawl or, you know, just walk in the wrong, wrong direction. Many, may, may, maybe some Christians are walking in the wrong directions. They are not following the, the lines of the, of, the, of the rules. So if we are running, run. If you are a Christian this morning, be a Christian. Be a runner. Be in, involved. Be in God's Olympics. Just don't mess up with that. This is important. Everyone who competes, that means there is a choice here. There's a will here. Everyone who competes, it's, it's a s personal decision. Do you want to compete in the game? Everyone who chooses to compete in the games will accept, not because other forces are forcing it on them, but willingly, they will understand the need and they will accept the need for strict training. Do you see it in yourself as a Christian? Because all of these are illustrations of the Christian life, of our walk of faith. So if these athletes are choosing the strict training in order to run to win, how about you and I this morning? This is, this is a good reminder. This is to refresh us. Are we serious? Are we engaged? Are we moving forward? Are we winning something? Are we going in the right direction? Are we running like God intends us to run? A strict training. Do you have a, st a strict training in your life? Do you have any discipline, like an awareness of the needs of personal disciplines, things that we choose, things that we refuse, things that we want to do daily because it's important. And uh, Pastor Jennifer and I, we have been starting in Melrose last year. We were going to the gym uh, every now and then. So sometimes we talk about it. It's really good. It forces us to, to do certain things beyond our mm, past activities. It just refresh physically. So we go into a strict training. They do it to get a crown. You know, when you get engaged in strict training, when you go to the gym, for instance, it also affects your mindset. Because you're doing some physical exercise, it will also make you think about what you eat. 
It will also make you think about other aspects of the discipline of life, of a healthy, of healthy living. It, it does that. It, it, you don't have to, to think about it. It comes by itself. And these athletes do it to get a crown that will not last, but you and I, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. This is so much important. If these athletes are doing so much effort so many years of their life going into such a hard training. I was reading this week, I read so much this, this week about the disciplines. I watched some, but I didn't watch as much as I wish I, I, I would. But I read, I, and I read about uh, Christian at least, because I was interested in that. That's what I will want to talk to you about. But these people are going into such a training. Years of their life they are going through. And it is for a goal. And we will see this morning how many of them, after they get their, 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 their goal, their prize, they are not really satisfied with that. You and I, we're running for something so much more important. You know, after you die, what's going to happen to the race, the effort of your race? Where are you going to spend eternity? That is so much more important than after the Beijing Olympics or after the London Olympics or the Rio Olympics. It's so much more important. Do you agree with that? After my life, I'm going to somewhere. I'm going to spend eternity with God. I'm going to be rewarded for my faith, for my, my works. Uh, this is so important in the New Testament. So that I myself will not be disqualified for, for the prize. How sad it would be to be disqualified. And it says in this text that only one gets the prize. I was reading about the ancient Greek Olympics. There was no prize. You know that there was no second prize. There was no third prize in the ancient Greek Olympics. This is modern Olympics to give you a, a silver, to give you a bronze. This was not at the time of the ancient Olympics. They would come to this camp one month before. They would be like in a punitive environment. They would be whipped and beaten and forced to, you know, excel themselves. And they had to win. They had to win. They had no other choice. That's why it says uh, in that particular context, if you understand the context of the ancient Greek Olympics, you understand only one gets the prize. It makes it even so much more dramatic. So what is God's Olympics goal for you? Because we're talking about Olympics. It's such an event. It's so inspiring and it's so uplifting uh, for all of us to see all these young people. Some of them are 16. Some of them are 20, 22, 19. It's so wonderful to see so much uh, uh, success going. I know that there is a, a Canadian 16-year-old uh, who won a gold. This is, this is awesome. First time to the Olympics, and she's got the gold medal already. 16 years old. This is so amazing. Could you do that? Could, could, is it possible that you, the young people, can win the gold medal for God? Yes? Yes, oh, they said yes, they said yes. I helped them to say yes. How, how can you enter the selections? How can you enter into this training camp? How can you be selected? How can you go further? How can you train? How can you be trained and how can you achieve the goal? So this morning I want to look at a few Christian athletes, Olympic champion. Some of them are well known to all of us and some of them, none of us know about anything. In the first service, most of them didn't know any of them. But they are great Christian. They are great Christians, but not always that great. So the first one I want to talk to you about, nobody knows about him. He's totally unknown. His name is Michael Phelps. <laughs> Michael Phelps. He's a superstar swimmer, everything, everybody knows this. The most decorated athletes of all times. We know that he's, he's such a, a figure, like somebody that you dream to, uh, to, to be like, you, you admire, he's, he's so admired. But did you know that after the London Games 2012, he attempt, he was contemplating suicide? You know that, many, some of you maybe have read a bit more about that. He, he, after the London Olympics, Michael Phelps stopped his career because he had paid such a price, uh, you know, and, and, and striving and for so many years and strict uh, training. Now he came to this top, yet he was already the most decorated. He says, that's enough, now I'm going to live my life. And he went to live his life recklessly. 
and uh, he, he, he was caught with a photo that w went viral on the internet of smoking marijuana and he came to two DUI driving under the influence he was arrested and after that he just got so depressed and this is what he says of himself I had no self-esteem no no self-worth I thought the world would just be better off without me I figured that was the best thing to do just to end my life. This great athlete, it's hard to understand or even think that a man and that uh, so high and, and, uh, and society and the positions of that everybody desire or dream of would think like that. Who do you think is behind such a mindset that is seeking life to destroy, to, to distract, to, to kill and to lie and to demolish life? You know, such a great athlete like that. His gold medals couldn't satisfy him. He had no purpose to keep on driving. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that such an athlete would come to that one. Then a National Football League superstar, an outspoken Christian, came to him and he exhorted Michael Phelps. He says, this is when we fight. This is when real character shows up. Don't shut down, Michael. If you shut down, we all lose. And this is a truth in that, in these words. If you shut down, we all lose. When a Christian friends around you shut down, we all lose. When a pastor shut down, all the Christian community, you all lose. When a, a, a big name in the Christian world commit a scandal, we all lose. You, you know, like your life, all of you, maybe you think not much of yourself, but you all have influenced someone. You all have told someone of your friends, I'm a Christian now, my life is different. I'm living for God now. If you shut down, it's a loss for anybody that knows you, that have heard you declare that you were a Christian, that you were living for God, that God made you happy, that God changed your life. When you shut down, the whole world shut down around you. You understand that? Yeah, so that's, that's the truth for, for a star, that's the truth for your life, that's the truth for a pastor, anyway. And Lewis convinced Phelps to go to rehab at that time, and he gave him Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. So he went to, with his book to rehab, because at this time he had asked his coach, you know, like, I want to go back to train. It was in 2012 uh, Olympics. With, uh, it, this crisis lasts until 2014, so you don't have much time to train for the next Olympics, the one in Rio. His coach says, you're not ready, you cannot compete like that. So he went to rehab with this book, and with this book, he transformed his life. He thanked Lewis for the book, and this is what he said about, uh, to Lewis. Man, this book is crazy. The thing that's going on, oh my gosh, my brain, I can't thank you freaking enough, man. You saved my life. These are the exact words of Phelps. You can sit in the video that is called uh, um, the story of Michael Phelps. It, it is all, all there. And I, oh, by the way, this week I will put on Facebook and on YouTube uh, different devotions of these Christian athletes that I will talk about. And I will also put some videos of them and, and a playlist that you will be able to share with, with friends. And, and Michael Phelps' story of how he went down after the Olympics and how God uh, rescued him will be one of them. So anyway, he explained in an interview, this book turned me into believing there is a power greater than myself and there is a purpose for me on this planet. Faith in God restores his perspective. You see, just before he wants to end his life, now he discovered that God has a purpose for his life. And during the time in his rehab, there's a time in the rehab uh, training that is, is for family to come for support and for reconciliation. And he reconnected with his father who abandoned the family when he was nine years old. And he, he went into a sports just to fill the void of his father and he had the grudge in his heart and the experience uh, healing for both of them. Then after rehab, Philip uh, Phelps asked his girlfriend to marry him, which is a good thing. Just after Rio's Olympics, they will get married and she became pregnant, she will have a son and when he saw his son, he just burst out in tears and to see the love of God and to realize something. So what do we learn about a story like that? 
It's the grace of God. The real hero and heroes and Christian heroes or any sorts of heroes, it's always God the real hero. Because for you and I to become a hero, it needs the power of God, the grace of God. By the grace of God, Phelps was rescued from the pit and brought back into life. He, what, but don't think that now Michael Phelps will all be a Christian, a perfect Christian. He's at the beginning of a Christian life. He will have the same struggle as you have. He will have to learn to know he's such a star in the world. The media are after him. So he will have to know how to uh, live with that. Phelps seems to have a better sense of who he is and what really matters in, in life. He understands that gold medals, no matter how many, have no power to save. He won 22 gold medals and five uh, bronze and silver medals. That's 27 medals for Olympics, 65 world gold medal championship, and many, many other medals in his life. And God has rescued a man when he was at the peak after he came down. The second uh, um, athlete that I want to talk about is a lady. And I'm sure not many of you know about her. We'll go to the next slide. Her name is Tamika Catchings. Do you know Kamita Kachings, anyone? No? All right, so same as me. We're learning together about somebody. It's really encouraging. The verse that you will see on this one is, No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. And she refers to times of adversities and handicap and accidents in her, in her career. And she says that we know that God caused everything to work together for the good because God has a purpose. And she has learned a secret in her life. She grew up in Chicago area. She showed athletic skills from her early age. Her father was a professional basketball player. She was born with a hearing disability, very serious in both ears, that affected her speech. And because of that, she was laughed at in schools. You can imagine how cruel people are. So she had to go to, to wear, as a child, hearing aid, and she had to go through speech therapy. I will put a video of her also on Facebook, and you will see that even now, as she speaks, it's not so easy to understand her. You can see the, the effect of it, but what a star and what a Christian she is. She says, I know that it is only by the grace of God that I stand here today. I think that God has allowed me to use my hearing disability and all of the adversity that I have faced as an example for so many all over the world. She, she sees God as a plan. She sees that God has worked some uh, weaknesses or adversities and disabilities to the glory of the Lord through, through her life. So as she grew up, she remembered that uh, mom and dad took her to, to church three to four times a week. And they were quite strict. And she was bored. Are you bored when you go to church sometime as a, as a young person? Maybe, maybe it is so. And then later on, it became like more like a social gathering. You know what she would do? She, 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 she did what many of the young people go when they sit together, like this morning in the church, but not you this morning, but many, <laughs> many of other young people, sometimes when they are in the back row of the church, they, they drew pictures. They pass notes and they talk, you know, secretly, or they send texts nowadays, you know, things like that. So she said, I totally overlooked the fact that my parents took me to church to build important spiritual values in my life. And this is encouraging for the parents. When you continually bring your children to church, even though you see sometimes uh, uh, that they are boredom or, you know, like they are not really there fully, but they are in the church and the Holy Spirit is here and the community, the love of the Christian are here and the words of the Bible are being spoken and it will eventually do something. I talked with one of my daughter uh, this week, and uh, she went to climb a mountain, a uh, very high mountain, about more than 6,000 feet, and she got scared at one point at, on the rock on the cliffs, and she told me, she says, I was so scared, Dad. Just, I, I, I screamed, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> She's screaming at Jesus. Anyway, so anyway, hallelujah. Later on in the middle school, the pa her parents divorced, and that was another layer of adversity. So she used sports 
to escape all the, the trouble in our life and the things that didn't go right. And second year of college, she attended a church service with some friends, and she heard the preacher talk about the fatherhood of God. Don't focus on your earthly father, but focus on your heavenly father. And that has really impacted her life, and she understood from that time on that God always had his hands upon her lives, and that it did something. She considered herself a Christian, but because she was an athlete, basketball was always first. Do you have that in your life, Christian, this morning? We are Christian. We go to church. But there's something that is really strong. There's something that's really pulling me. There's something that is more interesting. There's something that I have. I have my homework are more important. My exam are more important. My work is more important. Uh, anything else is more important. My competitions in sport. Parents, this is, this is really important. Uh, you know, you need to sort out your own priorities and your own life as parents and try to bring your children to put the priority at the right place. God should be the priority over anything else. I know it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is essential that we do everything we can on that one. So she was progressing, but she considered herself as a Christian, but not really like a committed Christian, we can say. So think about that when you come to church every Sunday, young people or anybody else. What's pulling you out of the room. Maybe you come late or you sit outside of the room with your friends, you talk there uh, during the praise and worship or you don't really care about praise and worship, you just want to hear the message afterwards or you go to the third floor, the children don't, parents don't let the children go to third floor during praise and worship. They should be here. Don't let them do their homework during the Sunday morning service. This is when God is going to touch their life. You know, be, be, be conscious of these things. And then at this point, when she came to a place where she was going to be chosen to join the professional basketball, uh, she tore an ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, and she was put aside. So it's like a crisis. I mean, you are there. You're going to get into the professional. That's your dream, your life. And then you tear up your muscles, and you have to be put away. Imagine how she felt at that time. She says later on, after she freaked out, she realized that God um, was second in her life. And this time was necessary to reorder some priority. Later on, she won. She joined eventually the, the World National Basketball Tournaments, and she became professional. And you know, after the championship where she headed for, she went to China. She went to China and she played uh, with the Guangdong Dolphins to, to just bring in some coaching experience, reaching out, because for her, she was now a true Christian. She had really embraced her faith, and her sports was a platform to, to bring the message of God. So she would exhort people, when we play, we play for an audience of one, which is God. You play. You win, you lose, you play before the Lord. So we need not to focus on need to win only. We need to focus on Him and be sure that no matter what, whether we win or lose, in the end, our glory, our effort is for the Lord. This is clear for you young people, your success, your achievement, or for you parents, or your work, or whatever it is, your efforts, your time, you're serving, you're, whatever you do, it is for the glory of the Lord. She says, throughout my career, I torn my ACL, my meniscus, my uh, Achilles tendon. And when I faced those tough times, it would have been easy to quit and to abandon. But I know that I represent God in everything I do. And I knew that God had a plan for me, for my life. And through these injuries and struggles, it drew me closer to the Lord. That's what she has learned through these adversities. I really admire the story of her life, the video that I heard about it, because adversities can put us off so much. We can just quit and turn and, and look at ourselves like, like failures, or we cannot, we cannot, and find all sorts of problems. I have personally experienced what it means to be victorious through Him who loves us. 
And that's the, the scripture says, I personally experienced what it means to be victorious. I can do all things. He can lift me up through his strength that is at work in my life. And all the things I have experienced have given me a platform to inspire others. Imagine a young person who is committed Christian to the Lord. She goes to Guangdong. She goes anywhere. She goes to the U.S. and school, high schools, and she speaks. She has stories to tell. She had adversities. Her life was not just like an easy floating over the, 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 the floor. She persevered. She put her tr tr uh, trust in God, and she moved uh, forward. And in the same way for her, God has a plan for each one of us in this room this morning. In the same manner. It doesn't matter. We, we all have our own struggles and hardship. But God has a plan for you. Discover that. The next, uh, at least I want to talk about, is Jordan Burroughs. Do you know him? Anybody knows Jordan Burroughs? No? Wow, we're all learning this morning together. He leads the humble in what is right. Psalm 25 says, and teaches them his way. Proverb 22, 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Jordan Burroughs, Olympic champion, freestyle wrestling, third time world champion, and two times Olympic gold medals. What an athlete he is. He's been uh, called the best uh, athletes uh, many, many times. What he says about himself, I wanted to be the best. From an early age, I dedicated time and sweat and at wrestling to excel. I knew my talent. He knew what, that he was strong. He knew he had it in him. And he leaned upon himself. He leaned heavily on who I was in the wrestling world. After winning the gold medal in 2012, he had his medal around his neck and was very successful, as you can see on the picture there. He had won everything. Nothing would stop him. He says, I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. I was extremely successful. I was praised by every wrestling fans in the world. My ego was huge. I idolized winning. I believe that all my success was due to everything I had done. I was extremely prideful. Wow, there's a little problem here. He won, and he did it by himself, all the things. Was he happy with that? After he won the, the gold medal in 2012, after a while, he turned to disappointment. That's it? I thought once I became an Olympic champion, I would feel complete. I'd be extremely happy. Instead, he felt empty. So just a few months later, in 2012, he was he accepted an invitation to a Christian conference, a Christian camp for young athletes, high school athletes, called 24 Hours for God from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He says, when I attended this camp, I expected to find the athletes excited for me to be there showing them wrestling uh, techniques. He's the, he's the hero, he's the gold medalist of wrestling. He's the, he's the strongest man probably in, a, in America among the athletes. So he goes to this Christian camp, he's expecting, of course, that all of them will be, oh, Jordan Burrow is here, oh, show us how, how to have success. They, they didn't seem to, to, to care about him. It was the most amazing things I've ever seen. I've never seen so many kids so happy and unashamed. They were less impressed with me being there and more happy that Jesus was in their presence. They were in the presence of Jesus. And then it touched him so much. He says, I wanted to live that life. I wanted to be one of these kids. I wanted to know Christ fully and completely. These kids opened my eyes. Instead of looking up to me, I was looking at these 14, 15 year old kids and that day opened my eyes. All I knew was worldly gold. God and his eternal treasures were nowhere near my desire. He never thought about really God, didn't care about it. I had reached the ultimate human success, but there was an emptiness nagging at me that wouldn't go away. What was I missing? And then the love of these young people. You see, you never know how your zeal for God, your enthusiasm for God, your testimony for God will do for someone who seems so far away from God, so 
proud, so full of himself. You know, sometimes you see some people, you don't want even to go near them. They are so, the sorts of bullies, sorts of so, so proud. You, you think that you, you're, you're, not, you're unable to reach people like that. But you love Jesus. And you never know your words, your character, what it will do to him. Here I was giving everything to the sports of wrestling as my life, while these young athletes set their hearts in an hour that won't tarnish. And I wanted that life. And then another coach who was also an Olympic uh, athlete explained to him the emptiness that he was feeling inside of him. He used the ex example of the climbing Mount Everest. He says, anyone climbing Mount Everest have to go back down. If you don't go back, you will run out of oxygen and deprivation. And the athletic world is the kind of the same. Once you reach this peak, you realize that you have to go back down. A gold medal is always going to leave you empty after the experience. We will always feel emptiness unless we have oneness with Jesus Christ. And at that time, Jordan received a Jesus. He let go of his pride. He, he put his trust in Jesus and his life began to change. He says, I came home from camp with a new outlook on life. I am not going to be defined by a gold medal anymore. I am going to be defined by my faith. It's more than wrestling. It's more than training. It's more than schools. It's more than jobs. more than winning, even gold medals. I come and go. Wrestling fades, but Jesus is for life. And this is the, the secret that he, he has learned to look to Jesus and consider that Jesus is the true victor. The humility of Jesus touched his life. You know, when, when you and I, we are facing people, you know, it, it seldom works when we tell them, come to church, go to church, or my church, this, my church, that. You know, people must f f fall in love with Jesus. They must see Jesus. And uh, I, I know some Muslim, that's what it says, the, some Muslim woman who testified, even one uh, from Algeria who was here last year, and she says when she has learned about Jesus, she fell in love with Jesus, and that's when she became a Christian. So people need to discover Jesus. So what uh, Jordan discovered in Jesus is his humility. He says Jesus is the true victor. He came to earth. He walked humbly, seeking the Father and everything. He overcame the cross. So we have confidence, not in our own abilities, but in him and him alone. And then he says that wrestling is like faith. It's like your faith and my faith. The same thing. You have room to improve. You need to train. It's the same thing. That's why the New Testament used so many uh, scriptures referring to the athletes, referring to the fight, the wrestling, the, the boxing, and all of these, the race and, and the, the competitions and things like that. So let's humbly follow Jesus Christ's example so that we, you and I will become the best and the, our best will be at the end an offering for Jesus because at first everything he did was for his ego and now everything he does is an offering to Jesus Christ and that's what we need to learn to do. There's a, another one that we want to look at. Uh, we'll show the, the picture first. Uh, David Bod Bodia, I think we pronounce. Yeah, a wonderful uh, David. Yeah, David Bodia. These are the, he's a diver. This is what you see here. All you who fear the Lord, trust the Lord. He is your helper and your shield. Exodus 20, verse 3, you must not have any other God but me. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, uh, just a part of the verse. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord transforms us into his likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. This uh, David here he says, For much of my life I bowed down at the feet of, of God's fashion of gold, silver, and bronze. And we have a video where he expressed how he moved to discover Jesus Christ. It's crazy to think what God can do to someone who is so obsessed with himself, lay him flat on his face and say, David, you're not going to be the ruler of your life. 
Just looking back at when I had this dream of wanting to become an Olympian and that pursuit towards that goal, I tried to fill that with whatever I could because I thought ultimately this would bring me happiness and joy and I didn't worship anyone else besides myself. Everything that I thought of, everything that I pursued was for my own gain. My first Olympic Games, I just realized that it wasn't working. Something There had to be something else besides this popularity or this pleasure or this desire that I had to be rich and famous that this American dream promised me. There had to be something more than that and I didn't know where to find that. God changed my heart and it was no longer look at me, I'm the best. Trying to be a, a visible representation of an invisible God, that, that's not the David of 2008. God has redeemed me and I've taken control of my life to, to do that for Him on a, on a platform that I never thought I would be at. The London Games was not a story I would have written whatsoever. Going into the finals, I was like the most nervous that I had been in a competition since I was 14 years old. And I spoke to a, a good friend of mine and he said, David, what is there to be nervous about? And I was like, okay, what are you getting at? And he said, uh, God has already written it. It's already done. What you get to do, what your opportunity is, is to be a vehicle for His glory. And so like instantly the weight was off of my shoulders. I just think of Philippians 4, 6, it just talks about be anxious about nothing, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And that was, that was totally my perspective that next day when I woke up was, was that. I knew that I put down six dives, the best that I've ever done in the competition, and I got out of the water and I, I didn't care where I was finishing, whether I was first or fifth. Um, I was content and happy because I, I knew I did my best and I walked over to Adam and uh, he embraced me and hugged me and I looked up and my name was first. One Chinese diver still had to go and he hit the water and my name didn't change and I still couldn't fathom like, so, so my name's first and there's no divers left. What? That means I won? And it was, it's still a surreal moment to think, think back at that, that specific moment. Three months after the Olympics in, in 2012, I got married to my wife, Sunny, and then two years after that, we had our first child, Dakota. And so I get to be dad. I get to be David, the husband, and it's a totally different thing. God has grown me so much in my communication with my wife. First year after the Olympics, it was atrocious. Just me trying to communicate and learn how to navigate marriage, and uh, he's grown me in that so much. And then uh, ultimately trying to, to raise a little girl that fears the Lord. Romans 8, 28 says, God works everything for the good of those who love him that are called according to his purpose. And that purpose isn't for my happiness and my joy. That purpose is so that I become more like Christ daily. Amen. What an encouragement these young Christian athletes are to all of us. An inspiration, a living inspiration of what Christ can do. And more important, what Christ wants to do. Like the last quote that he says, the purpose of God is not like just to make me, me happy or make me a success, but that I will become more like Jesus. This is what God's Olympics uh, is about. This is what the, the whole purpose of our life uh, is about. So I just want to look at the, the scriptures, uh, uh, the slide for the scriptures, and we will close with that. Uh, these are some of the, the scriptures I want to uh, impact your mind with this morning as, as we finish. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. This is what to be in God's Olympic is about. I have remained faithful. I have finished that fight against sin, uh, against my own flesh, against the world. I have kept God's purpose and God's interest, and I have lived for the Lord. Philippians 3, I have not achieved yet. We're not perfect, we're not complete yet, like none of these uh, Christian athletes are. But I focus on this one thing, and we go ahead, and we press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us.
Ephesians 3.20 tells us that if anything good is going to be produced in our lives, it has to be from God. And it, uh, it will always be beyond our own ability to do it by ourselves. Yeah, this is what it says. It will accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think or want or our own personal goal. This power, this mighty power working on us will bring us beyond. We will become the man and the women of God, the athletes, those who move forward, those who run the race, those who win the, the prize and the, the heavenly prize because of the power. If there is not this power, there's nothing. There's, I'm left with my own power. How am I going to accomplish that? It's impossible. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Physical training is good, but training for godliness. Training for God. Training to follow God. Training to love God. Training to know how to live with God every day. So much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. Isn't that what you desire this morning? Just in closing, a very, very short video that will teach you one expression that I want to leave with you as we, as we close. Thousands are gathered in Rio de Janeiro for the opening of the games of the 31st Olympiad. Its ancient origins honoring Greco-Roman gods. But did you know? The founder of modern-day Olympics, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, also educated by Jesuits, was influenced by a movement known as muscular Christianity, a movement that emphasized the importance of physical fitness and sport in developing Christian morality and character. Scholars have recommended that 2 Timothy 4.7, where Paul encourages, fight the good fight and finish the race, influence de Coubertin. He was convinced sports could strengthen both morality and character. The Bible, impacting the 2016 Olympic Games. Muscular Christianity is the words I want to leave with you at the end. Muscular Christianity. Is your Christianity muscular? Is it achieving? He says he's convinced that uh, physical activity, healthy body, uh, reaching out for the best, is bring something good in our spiritual life. There's a, there's a connection between the healthy living, living for God, pursuing the, the right things of this life with the right motives in order to, to really uh, get some treasures in, in heaven. Amen? We train for gold. A treasure that will last. Would you stand this morning? Hallelujah.